In the darkest days of the Third Reich, the most terrifying sound was a knock on the door. Everyone who lived under the Nazi yoke was in fear of a secret organization, one that Hitler called his deadliest weapon. Without it, Hitler's ambitions could never have been realized. As an instrument of state terror, it's rarely been equal. Yet until now, its full story has not been told. It was called the Gestapo. The Gestapo was an organization of contradictions. It appeared to be all-knowing, yet its intelligence success was limited. Its public figureheads were among the most familiar of the ruthless and ambitious Nazi leaders. But the real architect of its success shunned the limelight. Even during the height of its terror, few recognized the sinister genius who guided the Gestapo. And although its name has exerted a sinister fascination for more than half a century, the Gestapo's workings have remained shadowy. there is evidence. Inside testimony from the very center of the Gestapo machine. Double agents and resistant spies add their voices to those of the regime's victims. Many are now dead, but their words recorded in diaries and journals and dramatized here live on. I penetrated the Gestapo as an unpaid part-time assistant to Lieutenant Franz Buhler, Gestapo officer in charge of espionage and arrests, himself a British agent. And from then on, I had to live with the ever-present fear of being found out and subjected to the frightful tortures and death reserved for secret agents caught by the Gestapo. Gestapo. The word itself has a special resonance around the world. But how much blood, how much misery, how much sorrow but above all, how much cruelty is bound up with it. The Gestapo have left us another witness, their own meticulous bureaucracy. In repositories left over from the former Reich, thousands of Gestapo files detail the lives of those who came into their hands. Most of the Gestapo's victims did not survive, but some are still alive. Dorr was arrested by the Gestapo in 1942 when he was 19. He was interrogated and tortured to the point of death. All of this is recorded matter-of-factly in his file. Gestapo 4C, Roman number 4C, due to subversive activity. <laughs> My God. Is this the first time you've seen your picture? It's the first time I've seen the original. It makes me very sad to see all this. It reminds me of that terrible time. The name Gestapo epitomizes the horror of the Nazi secret police. Although the Gestapo was only one of a network of equally ruthless Nazi security agencies. Its image is of a flawless, coldly efficient machine. By reputation, its network of officers spread everywhere. Yet it was a small organization. In 1941, there were only 8,000 officers, overseeing more than 70 million people. The archetypical Gestapo officer is a sinister figure in a black leather coat. But in fact, most of the Gestapo's staff were faceless bureaucrats. How then did the Gestapo exert such total control over the actions of such a large, ever-increasing population, and perhaps more importantly, over their imaginations? The answers lie in the complex history of Hitler's governance of the Third Reich. For the Gestapo did not come into being fully fledged. Its growth was gradual, its progress dictated by the ambitions and rivalries of its early creators. Yet, through all its stages, it was driven by a simple aim, total social control. Its works lay in the unrest of the years following the First World War. 
Germany, humiliated by the Allies, stripped of its power and forced to pay huge sums in reparations, faced anarchy and ruin. A rudderless government watched fascists and communists fight on the streets as local Prussian police struggled to keep control. Into the chaos came Adolf Hitler, promising order, safety, and self-respect, a new dawn. With relief, Germany accepted his offer. The Nazi party triumphed at the ballot box, and in January 1933, Adolf Hitler became chancellor. Well, the German people's response to the uh, political agitation and street violence was one of extreme disquiet, naturally enough. Uh, they were fed up with these incessant brawls between the Nazis and their opponents, the communists, the social democrats. And I think it's true to say that the German people looked towards a party or a government that would bring order to the streets. And ironically enough, of course, the party that said they could do this were the Nazis. Hitler lost no time in securing his position. The people had voted for security. What they got was enforcement. Hitler's ambitions demanded absolute power, but this was not yet within his grasp. To achieve it, he had to suppress a still active opposition. His first tools were crude but effective, the SA or stormtroopers. Under their thuggish leader, Ernst Wurm, the SA had been Hitler's most loyal supporter during his rise to power. With their paramilitary uniforms and arbitrary violence, they were at home in the unrest that had brought Hitler into office. Hans Bernd Gesevius was a young Prussian lawyer at the time. Later, he would go on to plot from inside the Nazi regime to assassinate Hitler. Without really thinking it through, the party appointed the SA as an auxiliary police force. For 15 months, Hitler let them run things. It was only natural they should feel they were the real victors. Before long, they were leaving the real policemen behind at headquarters, and they roamed the streets alone in search of enemies of the state. With Hitler's blessing, the SA now owned the streets of Germany. They adopted a zero-tolerance policy, and its rules were clear. The SA's word, even its merest whim, was law. Anything, even failing to salute them correctly, was enough to result in arrest. Hitler's message was simple. In the new Germany, opposition was useless. It was crude and shocking, but it was effective. And its uncompromising stance was the foundation for what was to come. Hitler had already taken control of the newspapers. They were running repeated scare stories about the Marxist threat, uncovering alleged plots and fomenting fear. The SA took this as permission to target any organization. That was an experience. It was a really significant experience for me. All of us children, we were in the Falcons' youth house. That's what we were called, the Socialist Falcons. And we were attacked on the games afternoon by the SA and the Hitler Youth. We were just children, but we were chased out, and the grown-up helpers were beaten up, wretchedly beaten up. Within four weeks of Hitler coming to power, the Reichstag, the national parliament and symbol of democracy, was ablaze. Amid the outrage, Hitler blamed the communists, calling them a murderous plague and claiming that God had ordained that they be beaten down with an iron fist. Many have suggested that it was the SA, in a plan inspired by Hitler himself, who were the real instigators of the fire. Whatever the truth of it, this emotive event was very opportune for Hitler. It enabled him to demand a state of emergency, declared next day by the ailing German president, Paul von Hindenburg. Civil rights were suspended, and the German people lost their last protection. It had taken only weeks for Hitler to achieve the crucial move that was to make the Gestapo possible. Anyone could be arrested at any time and held indefinitely. 
The SA had played a pivotal role, but it was too blunt an instrument for what Hitler now had in mind. He needed something much more refined, and within the coming months, he would find the way to create it. In 1933, Germany had voted Hitler and his Nazi party into power and allowed all civil rights to be suspended. Hitler was working on his master plan for the Third Reich, but meanwhile, the auxiliary police, the SA, were in control of the streets. They made so many arrests that there was nowhere to put their prisoners. At this time arose the bunkers, the terrible private jails of the SA. Taking away unfortunate victims became a customary right of the SA. The sort of violence that went on in our cities is almost beyond belief. These so-called wild camps were improvised prisons. In Oranienburg, for example, a disused brewery was commandeered. While the propaganda film showed this as a disciplined re-education center, complete with morning exercises, the truth was very different. 900 people were crammed in here at the mercy of the SA, who tortured and killed with a completely free hand. Everyone had their turn, of course. The Red Front, the Social Democrats, anyone who wasn't a fascist, and the Jews. The SA's anti-Jewish campaign had been steadily mounting. Josef Goebbels, Hitler's propaganda minister, legitimized it by announcing measures against all Jewish businesses in Germany. The SA needed no further encouragement. Their behavior became even more outrageous, and it was the Jews who bore the brunt of it. Even Hitler's supporters were shocked, and abroad there was outrage. Hitler reined the SA in. They had played their part. The regular police returned to the streets. For Hitler was working on a bigger plan. He had seen the SA's effectiveness in controlling opposition, but he was also aware of their crude self-indulgence, their corrupt leadership, and their lack of discipline. This was not the image he wanted to project. He knew exactly what he did want, something that could take the fear created by the SA and refine it a secret political police force to serve Führer, Party, and Reich. He called it the Geheime Staatspolizei, the secret state police. But it would come to be known by its abbreviation, a word that was to become synonymous with fear, Gestapo. Hitler already had security and surveillance units in place as a matter of course. But the Gestapo was to be something different. It was to be secret, but very well known. The new force had its headquarters in the Prince Albrechtstrasse in Berlin. At first, it had jurisdiction only in the large eastern province of Prussia, and there were just 200 officers, all highly educated careerists. As their leader, Hitler had chosen Hermann Göring, among the most ambitious and vain of all the Nazi inner group. Göring guarded his executive power over the police force in Prussia very closely. The Gestapo was his pampered child, and he knew only too well that it held the key to his power. The Führer enjoyed reading his spicy and highly dramatized secret reports. Goering's brief was simple, to seek out opposition wherever it lay. But the Nazis' main enemies, communists, social democrats, and trade unions, had by then gone underground. Finding them would take skill the skill of trained police. Goering made sure the new force knew that this was a different sort of police work. They were not there simply to pursue criminals. But Goering was soon to have competition. 
Heinrich Himmler and Reinhard Heydrich, two rising stars in the Nazi hierarchy, were casting covetous eyes at the new organization. Himmler had been at Hitler's side since the early days in Munich, capital of the southern province of Bavaria, where the whole Nazi movement had started a decade before. There, he led the SS, Hitler's personal security service. Under him, the SS had expanded, extending its reach over the Bavarian police. Not surprisingly, he was taking a close interest in the development of the Gestapo, as was his fellow SS leader, Reinhard Heydrich, a clever and ambitious young Nazi. Heydrich was the hidden pivot around which the Nazi regime revolved. The development of a whole nation was guided by his forceful character. Heydrich was, in fact, the puppet master of the Third Reich. Himmler and Heydrich had recruited a third member of their team, a trained professional they trusted implicitly. An experienced, dedicated policeman, Heinrich Müller was destined to have a profound influence on the future of the Gestapo. Müller joined the Munich political police as his first job, and he made a name for himself as a very effective uh, surveyor of the communists. He, in many respects, fitted the mold. He was ambitious, he was ruthless, he was committed, he was obedient, and although he wasn't a Nazi before 1933, Heydrich and Himmler were very clear that this is the sort of person whose experience they needed. Müller was unlike his immediate bosses. He rejected the trappings of power in favor of total focused professionalism. Any form of conversation with him was almost impossible. It consisted on his part almost entirely of coldly phrased questions and was largely an interrogation. He once said to me, one really ought to drive all the intellectuals into a coal mine, then blow it up. Even as the fledgling Gestapo was establishing itself in Berlin, the SS trio in Munich were embarking on a new scheme that was to mark out Nazi policy from anything that had gone before. Building on the idea of the bunkers, they were planning a camp near Munich in a suburb called Dachau. Here, the SS were to concentrate all those deemed to be enemies of the state. By summer 1933, the scheme had taken off. 26,000 people had been interned in camps across Germany, several thousand of them in Dachau. Anna Prull was a member of a resistance group. Many of her friends were arrested for their political activities in 1933 and brought to Dachau. The communist, Leonard Hausmann, was in the workers' home. I told him about the posters on the billboards that Hitler is now Chancellor of the Reich. He then packed a few things and left his office. He didn't run away. He simply left the office. And when they arrested him, that was in March 33, they took him to Dachau, where he was shot on the 17th of May. To the outside world, Dachau was presented as a rest camp. But soon, the truth became obvious. We heard that Dachau was not a re-education camp, as they had always told us. You went in without any trial and didn't know how long you'd stay or whether you'd ever come out alive. And we heard that people were tortured there and beaten and you could also die there. 
the inmates of the concentration camps were officially held in what was called protective custody. Protective custody in the Third Reich meant a knock on the door at three or four o'clock in the morning by the Gestapo, being bundled off without packing any supplies or clothes, without even saying goodbye to one's loved ones, and being taken to a concentration camp, where immediately there would be a process almost of dehumanization. I was taken into protective custody. They protected society from us, as it were, the other way round. And they didn't need any proof or anything. They could send you to a camp, an extermination camp, without anything. They didn't need anything to do it. In the concentration camps, the SS trio had created the ultimate punishment for dissenters. In Berlin, the Gestapo was setting up a super-efficient machine for detecting them. For the power-hungry Himmler and Heydrich, the prospect of gaining control of both was irresistible. Relations between Hitler's henchmen and the newly Nazi Germany were a constant power struggle on endlessly shifting ground. Hitler's technique for controlling his deputies was to encourage rivalry between them fanning their insecurities by shifting favorites. The result was a potent mix of paranoia, plot, and counterplot. Gradually, Himmler mounted his challenge to take over the Gestapo. He had already taken control of local political police services throughout the country. And the SD, a department of the SS headed by Heydrich and dedicated to rooting out traitors in the Nazi ranks, had raised its profile and activity levels. Early in 1934, Himmler boarded a train to Berlin with his underlings, Heydrich and Müller. Hitler, impressed both with Himmler's concentration camps and his political skills, abandoned Goering and switched his favor to his dear Heinrich. He agreed that the whole country's police, spearheaded by the Gestapo, should be unified under Himmler's personal control. Hitler transferred the Gestapo officially from Goering to Himmler in Berlin. Heydrich became head of the Gestapo office, with the highly efficient Müller as his deputy. Goering was not to lose out. Within months, he was heading the newly built Air Force. From then on, the whole country's political police force was controlled from Berlin. The Gestapo technically remained just a regional force, but the reality was that all regional secret police forces fell under the Gestapo banner. The structure of the security forces, never straightforward, was still fluid. The SS under Himmler retained an overall role, responsible for numerous departments, including administration, finance, foreign intelligence, the regular criminal police, and the SD. Müller took over the running of the Gestapo. It was a perfect job for him. His zeal was equaled only by his obsession with efficiency. Soon, he had things the way he wanted. The Gestapo brief was clear and unambiguous. They were to be the means of cleansing Germany of all political, social, racial, and cultural impurities. If their methods came into conflict with existing statutes, the Gestapo would take precedence. Each person who passed through Gestapo hands was photographed, fingerprinted, and given a file card with personal details recorded along with the crime, details of the interrogation, and action taken. In these card indexes lay the Gestapo's power. Have a look. In this box is this index, and look right here, under L. You must be in this box. Let's go to the table and see if your file is really in here. In the Vienna archive, 50,000 dossiers still hold the details of communists, trade unionists, theologians and churchmen, all potential members of any opposition in the area. Among them, Hans Landauer. So, here's your card, look. Here's your name, single, birthplace, a physical description, 180 tall, pale, thin, and here. You see, these numbers refer to other documents that the Gestapo have on you. Here's your personal Gestapo file, where the actual documents were, and your charge sheet. 
The files look like those of any large bureaucracy. The language is formal, and there are boxes for each piece of information. It is as if the official appearance of the paperwork legitimizes the actions it so conscientiously records. We were completely open to them. They could do what they wanted with us. No justice, no law or anything. It was an institution that paid no heed to anything. The new security supremos appeared frequently in public, with the exception of Müller, who persisted in keeping a low profile. They gave the impression of total confidence, but their problems were not quite over. There was a serious threat to their ambitions. Despite their removal from the streets, the SA had not gone away, and nor had their leader, Ernst Röhm. He was a member of the, the old-school, old-fighter Nazi generation, if you like. His contribution was crucial to the Nazi seizure of power. But once the Nazis had seized power, there was a problem. What did one do with the SA? After their original wild rampages, the SA had been restrained by Hitler. But Röhm was still determined to strike out and complete his German revolution. In Röhm's eyes, the Nazi party owed its entire success to his SA and deserved to have the police and military power as their reward. The situation was complicated by the fact that Röhm was one of the very few who were on familiar terms with Hitler. He was Hitler's chief of staff. In public, Hitler supported Röhm in his aspirations. Röhm was convinced he could transform his undisciplined squadrons into carders for the army of the future. His idea was simple and logical. The sooner he took advantage of the first upsurge after the seizure of power to hack through the jungle of laws and the mazes of foreign policy, the sooner his revolutionary army would become the German army of the future. Röhm was becoming a problem. Hitler, adopting his usual divisive techniques, set up his other henchmen to bring Röhm down. The Behul rowdies of the SA were beyond the pale. They represented the most extreme, violent, and fanatical elements of the Nazi movement in those days. Röhm's activities in setting up a private militia may have constituted a threat to the state, but this was only a pretext. In the ambitious Himmler and the still more ambitious Heydrich, Hitler had willing executioners, each of whom seized the opportunity to build up his own power. On the 27th of June, 1934, at a secret meeting in the Prince Albrechtstrasse, Heydrich announced that intelligence confirms that the SA under Röhm is planning a coup. This was a deliberate lie. Heydrich and Müller coordinated a so-called counter-operation from Gestapo headquarters. Heydrich prepared a list, signed off by Hitler, of those who were to be shot. Within days, the newsreels were reporting their success. Ninety internal opponents, including Ernst Röhm, had been liquidated in the purge, which became known as the Night of the Long Knives. The police paraded in triumph outside Hitler's office. Zur Weimarisch eine Abteilung der Landespolizeigruppe General Göring an der Reichskanzlei am Tage der Aburteilung der Hochverräter. The SA had been smashed. With that threat removed, Himmler's security services had unlimited power. The Gestapo was now ready to move ahead. Nothing.
nothing, and nobody could stop it. Hitler, Himmler, Heydrich, and Müller were now in complete control of Germany's security. The country's political police, under the orders of the Gestapo, were already well on their way to suppressing all dissidents. Under Müller, who had made a study of the notorious Soviet secret police, the Gestapo was establishing its trademark methods. They were all designed to create fear. Johann Schwert was part of what little opposition remained, printing and distributing leaflets, raising funds for the civil war in Spain. I hardly got into the flat when two armed men appeared outside the door. I was taken directly from the flat to prison, police prison. They knew so much about me because they'd already interrogated people. That's when they began to hit me in the face. I was beaten up in the first hour. It's a terrible thing when you don't know when you're hauled from your cell what's going to happen to you. I had a thick sweater on when I was arrested. I kept it on day and night as protection. Because I knew that whenever I was taken below, I'd be beaten. It went on for days, day and night, day and night. Johann Schwert was to pass through 14 prisons before his eventual release in 1945, 10 years later. Five of those years were spent in solitary confinement, broken only by Gestapo interrogations. Yet Schwert is one of the lucky ones. Few of the Gestapo's other victims survived. In the propaganda, though, the Gestapo were shown as guardians of the people there to serve. Posters portrayed the police as friend and helper, protecting society from the dark forces that threatened it. They even featured in children's games. It was all part of Müller's carefully conceived strategy, designed to create a specific image of the Gestapo in the public mind. And that image was of an all-powerful body able to strike its enemies at will. The classic Gestapo knock on the door, sudden, swift, and anonymous, underlined the illusion of their complete control. As part of this, Müller encouraged the belief that the Gestapo were everywhere. Propaganda stories were planted in the newspapers to strike fear into potential protesters. The reports described a constant stream of arrests. In effect, they were lengthy advertisements for Gestapo power. We talked about how the Gestapo watched people and ensured that no one said anything bad about the regime. The great strength of the Gestapo was the um, publicity, or more, more specifically the propaganda uh, surrounding it, the myths surrounding it, that the Gestapo were here, there and everywhere, um, so that uh, any German, when making a comment that was going to be mildly even adverse to the regime, would look over his shoulder. And it was known as the German look, the Deutsche Blick. In fact, the Gestapo's knowledge was less comprehensive than its carefully maintained image implied. But the accumulation of information was still much greater than could be expected from such a small group of officers. How was this achieved? The answer lies in these files. Meticulously maintained, they record millions of pieces of personal information. And most of it was brought to the Gestapo by informers. It was Germany's public who did much of the Gestapo's work. The officers were mostly employed to analyze and collate the data that came in. 
I said, what's up with you? A tailor about 50 years old. My daughter has denounced me and my wife. She wanted to marry an SS man, and the parents didn't want her to. So she went to the Gestapo, and the parents were arrested. It wasn't just personal issues. There were a lot of people that were quite happy to inform on their neighbors if they were making adverse comments about the Hitler regime. Some did it in the sincere belief that Germany's future was more important than the fate of individuals. Others did it out of envy or revenge, still more informed to save themselves or their families, for it was known that Gestapo's suspicion led to the concentration camps. An officer's word was all that was needed. And it soon became common knowledge that the Gestapo equated mercy with weakness and regarded weakness as fatal to the regime. It was terrible to be arrested. It meant death. We were always hearing, so-and-so has disappeared. Officially, you weren't permitted to talk about it. But amongst ourselves, we did. And we knew just what it meant. There was a terrible feeling of being defenseless and humiliated. Inhumanity. Inhumanity. How can such, such an idiot get into the position of torturing another human being? It was a threat. It was really the epitome of what the Nazi regime was. You could say you felt it like the fist of the Nazis. The Gestapo's reputation was firmly established, and opposition to the Nazi party was largely crushed. By the late 1930s, the Gestapo had purged Germany of all visible resistance. This was the moment when its leaders felt it could fulfill its true destiny and shape the future of the Thousand-Year Reich. Heydrich put the Gestapo's new task into words. The police of the National Socialist State will now above all fulfill the task of rebuilding the people's society from the ground up, according to the precepts of the political leadership. The Nazi ideal was the Volksgemeinschaft, the people's society. This society was to be based on equality, unity, and social harmony, but only for those who qualified. It required absolute conformity. The Gestapo's task was to draw up lists of those whose actions made them unfit. Crimes that earned inclusion on the lists were many and varied. The Gestapo were not expected to round up those on the lists. There were simply too many of them, and the task was delegated to local police forces. One group targeted by the lists was the Jews. Soon the discrimination was made legal. On the 15th of September, 1935, the Nuremberg Laws were announced. Discrimination against the Jews now had an official basis, the racial laws. People needed little encouragement. You weren't allowed to mix with Jews. I even saw how someone was brought out, a woman, who had had a Jewish boyfriend, and she had to wear a sign saying, I'm a great swine, I go with Jews. A new breed of pseudoscience entered the curriculum. I was a so-called first-degree half-breed, and Hitler hated them especially, because the Nuremberg Laws said I couldn't marry one of those so-called Aryans, but I could marry another half-breed, because the resulting offspring would be a cretin, and the child could then be murdered straight away. That's what we were told, and I just sat there and thought, this can't be happening. 
The teacher said something like, I've remembered it my whole life. He said, in this school year, we're going to look at racial studies. And I can tell you right now that Löwenberg belongs to an inferior race. That's all that he said. And I went home bawling my eyes out. Das war alles, was er gesagt hat. Und ich bin dann heulend nach Hause gegangen. The Nazi leaders worried little about the effect of their laws on children. They were more concerned with shoring up their own power. Himmler was now so popular with Hitler that he was appointed head of all German police, which meant effectively that the police force now became an arm of Gestapo power, not the other way around. The Gestapo's reach was spreading. So effective were the Gestapo in their domestic tasks that by the end of the 30s, they were ready to spread their wings further. And Hitler was ready with a new role for them. He had plans to expand the Third Reich, and the new conquests would need to be pacified. Hitler assigned the Gestapo the task of dismantling resistance abroad. Heydrich prepared the plans. The Gestapo was to accompany the German armed forces, the Wehrmacht, on their first moves abroad into the territory of Germany's friendliest neighbors. Müller assigned his most trusted officers to draw up secret lists of those likely to cause trouble. They would be arrested and removed as soon as the military move began. Austria, in March 1938, was the first to be annexed. While thousands celebrated, the Gestapo was already hard at work. All I know is, on the first night, they arrested the former authorities from between 1934 and 38, and everyone on the left, communists, social democrats, and liberals alike. Just a few months later, the army marched unopposed into Sudetenland, the German-speaking part of Czechoslovakia. Just like Austria, it was seen as home territory despite being in another country, and its annexation was largely uneventful. Here, too, the Gestapo came with its lists. Then on to Prague. With Sudetenland fallen, it was an easy matter to take the Czech capital as well. Hitler had expanded the Reich virtually unopposed. And while the Gestapo cleansed the new territories of every hint of opposition, his popularity rose to an all-time high. There was little hope that Hitler would stop his aggression here. His propaganda machine began to hint at war in Europe. And at Gestapo headquarters, the plans had already been laid. Heydrich, Müller, and a small band of trusted Gestapo officers were preparing Operation Tannenberg. It was a ruthless, brutal scheme, deliberately intended to deceive both the German public and the world at large. The Gestapo had been entrusted with masterminding a plan that was to throw Europe and ultimately the whole world into war. Its power was now immense. By the start of the war, the Gestapo is at the center of a huge terror apparatus which has arms stretching into every part of German society. It had effectively crushed the left. It was well on the way to enacting its vision of a German people's community in which internal aliens would be eradicated, and it was perfectly placed to police German society once war broke out. It was a historic moment. Müller and his Gestapo were poised to add millions more to their lists of ruined lives. And they were more than ready for the new challenges that lay ahead. 
After they set up their secret police system, the Nazis worked hard to make it run with pitiless efficiency. But identifying those to be imprisoned, tortured, and exterminated demanded more than brute force and cold calculation. It meant attracting the right kind of people to do the job. Gestapo continues next on the History Channel.